Could you please define what regenerative agriculture is for listeners that don't know, and how is it um, different than currently practiced agriculture and corporate farming, and what are the benefits of regenerative agriculture? I mean, naturally, I'm hip to these, but I think this is very important yeah. for the audience to to either be reminded of or to to learn. Yeah. So essentially for the last 10,000 years, we've kind of been living in an extractive relationship with our planet. We're, we're often taking out more than we're putting back in and, um, you know, different types of agriculture, organic and conventional and regenerative do this to a, a different extent. But we're at a time when 70 percent of the carbon in our soil or our soil is basically depleted and we lose about 30 million acres every single year of farmable land. And what you'll see, there's this fascinating map, and I'm sure you're very familiar with this, Paul. A lot of the desertified lands in mm-hmm. uh, across the world were once our most fertile lands, right? It's people yeah. just kind of abuse the land. And so what regenerative agriculture does, a lot of the people I talk to, they say there's three types of agriculture today. Conventional, right, with its fertilizers and its chemicals and we're working against nature. And then there's sustainable, which a lot of people are thinking, okay, we need to do sustainable agriculture. That's something like organic, right? It's not making the land worse. And and sometimes it's making it better, but not always because there's still a lot of tillage in organic agriculture, which is one of the most destructive practices. And then there's regenerative. So the reason regenerative agriculture is very different is it because it is its priority is to improve the ecology, right? Starting with the life in the soil, which we didn't really understand the importance of until very recently. I've even talked to people who went to school for agriculture and they were taught about the chemistry of soil, but not so much the biology. We're now waking up to the incredible importance of this biology. And so regenerative agriculture is one that takes land and returns it to a more higher and worthy state, essentially working with nature and just creating and improving the cycles of nature. And can actually improve and regenerate topsoil. That's exactly right. Yeah, there are six principles of regenerative agriculture, essentially. The first is context, right? We cannot do the same things everywhere on every farm. You really have to be mindful of the context. And then we have least disturbance. As I talked about tillage, it's interesting because we've been tilling land, which created the first Dust Bowl. And then some experts believe, Alan Williams talked to me, said we're in the midst of the second Dust Bowl. And again, that's because we're disturbing the soil with this tillage and disrupting that soil biology. But also this disturbance is in terms of pesticides and chemicals and fertilizers. And then we have living roots. We want to really maximize the amount of roots in the soil because the roots and the plants create exudates that go down into the soil. A lot of aggregates. Yeah, exactly. A lot of them. And this soil structure that we really, really need to prevent erosion and help water holding capacity. And then we have soil armor. A lot of farms today are growing cash crops and they're only being grown for about a third of the year. And the other time the soil kind of lays bare. And when soil is bare, it's, you know, it can erode. Obviously, carbon can be sequestered. But it also kind of gets like a sunburn. And so you always want to have it covered. That's another one of the principles. And then biodiversity is just how do we increase the land or the life in the land? And that often starts underground with the microbes and making sure that the cows are pooping and peeing and they have their saliva. And it's just an explosion of life. Underground creates an explosion of life in terms of the the vegetation and then more animals, more birds, more pollinators. Everything comes back. And animal integration is the last one. A lot of people think that cows and and animals are bad for the land. And in some cases, they absolutely can be when they're allowed to overgraze. Um, And that's another thing. Even in the grass-fed market, sometimes we're talking about continuous grazing, which is very different than a regenerative practice where you will move the animals in a way that mimics these predatory prey cycles. Right. How the ecosystem evolved. And so there is some truth to animal impact being deleterious, but when they're used in these highly managed systems, um, they're actually the very solution that we need. And I just think it's fascinating that most people would tell you that agriculture is only healthy without animals, but animals provide the nutrients with their poop and their pee and their saliva, and then they stimulate grass growth because they're constantly biting at the grass. And then that grass acts like a straw and sucks carbon out of the air and puts it back into the soil. So animals are absolutely critical to the health of ecosystems. That's how the ecosystems evolved. And I think it's one of the big misunderstandings that I want to help people um, dismember. And 
Yeah, it's very, very important. In my library, um, I'm trying to remember the title of the book, but it's one of the books on, on farming that I've studied. But they showed that the average farming family using commercial and chemical methods destroys 7,000 acres of farmland in the life of that family. Wow. And I've seen maps like you were referring to showing how we're basically growing deserts larger and larger, all of which used to be farmed land, and it's just completely wiped it out. Uh, the other thing, um, one of my favorite books is Science in Agriculture by Arden B. Anderson, who's a unique guy because he's a osteopathic physician, but he's also got a PhD in soil science. He actually uh, is a physician, I believe it, for the Air Force working with pilots, but he's also a worldwide uh, consultant on farming, and I've done his course in agriculture. And um, he describes in his book, and by the way, Autumn, for you, he's got one of the most comprehensive sections on soil microorganisms loaded with phenomenal research out of Russia that's very uh, seldom ever seen over here. But he shows in there that what we call vitamins are actually plant hormones and he shows that within the rhizosphere or the root space of almost any plant or combination of plants, you can find every hormone produced by the plant that is in the human body. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Um, now, we've talked about Bill Gates and, and some of his <laughs> typical bullshit. Um can you share what the real research has to say about how the different types of agricultural uh, agriculture affect environmental health? Right. Yes, this is a really fascinating area of research. And what a lot of times people are talking about and demonizing animal products is because they're looking at this conventional system, right? You know, that is destroying the planet. And, and so there's been research conducted around regenerative agriculture, which has been really exciting. Dr. Jason Roundtree, Michigan State, I believe, he did one piece of research that showed that when you considered the amount of carbon that is sequestered, that an AMP grazing system or this rotational grazing system versus a feedlot system was actually able to sequester carbon and yields a, a positive net impact. And then we had uh, Will Harris's analysis down at White Oak Pastures in Bluffton, Georgia. And this is my favorite because they looked at the entire life cycle of his animals and then got like a pound per carbon equivalent um, released for every pound of beef produced. And what they found was they actually sequestered 3.5 pounds of carbon for every pound of beef produced. Wow. Now, I know, which is amazing. It's, it's a net positive. Yes. So when you compare that to conventional beef, which is about 33 pounds per pound produced, and then pork, wow. which was about nine, chicken was about two, and um, soy, I'm sorry, soy was about to, he said he knew there was a God when they found that for these meat alternatives beyond meat, um, an impossible burger, they release about 3.5 pounds per pound. In other words, you would have to consume one of his regeneratively raised burgers to offset the emissions of um, their fake meat burger. And so it's it really awesome. All of these protein sources and Regeneratively raised beef was the only one with a net positive impact. But again, the delta between conventionally raised beef and regeneratively raised beef, it was huge, right? So if we're looking towards a more sustainable closed loop system, I think it's pre pretty clear that regeneratively raised beef is that uh, the best alternative. And the last piece of research that I wanted to share was um, Robin White did a, an analysis of what would happen if 300 million Americans went vegan. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. something bad <laughs> well yeah that that and, and she was looking through the lens of what would the emissions impact be and she found emissions would be reduced by about 2.6 percent which you know is 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 not nothing but isn't also super dramatic and we also know that we're never going to get all 300 americans or million americans to become vegan so if we looked at 10 percent, which is even way more than it is exists right now it'd be less than you know even a half of a percent but what she did find is that grain consumption would increase dramatically and we would have nutrient deficiencies in things like calcium um, and DHA. And her conclusion was, too, that we didn't even consider the availability of the nutrients in the feed. And so if we did take the, that into consideration, 
we would likely see even more nutrient deficiencies as a result of that diet. And so it's just interesting to me that the the mainstream narrative is loud that the way forward is absolutely plant-based agriculture, but the nuances in animal agriculture, one can be deleterious, yes, but one is actually the best environmental solution that we have so far. And also we have to remember that in terms of plant agriculture, we can come from this conventional, very destruct- destructive system, right? Or it can come from an organic system. And so you have to play into that and prioritize the organic types of agriculture. And the last thing is when we're comparing animal foods to plant foods, a lot of times they're just comparing calories, right? Calorie for calorie. That is a very big problem because we need calories from animal products specifically, and they're often a lot more nutrient dense. And so that's just not a fair way to compare. Yes. A couple of things came to my mind. One, we haven't really specifically mentioned this, but probably 90 to 100 percent of all the plants that are going to be used for this huge plant-based diet that Bill Gates and crew want to give are all genetically modified. And I've got numerous studies in my library showing that when they fed rats and researched genetic, genetically modified foods of any type, they had organ malformation, they had uh, higher rates of stillbirth and birth defects, they had brain defects, they had digestive tube defects, um, a lot of stuff that you don't ever re- read about in the public because, as usual, they suppress all that stuff. Um, if you could just go back a little bit, you were moving at quite a quick pace. I heard you say that a commercially raised farm animal, it takes, was it 33 pounds of meat for one pound of carbon sequestered? Oh, yes. No, it's to, it releases 33 pounds of carbon equivalent for one pound produced. Okay, so it's releasing it into the atmosphere for every one pound of meat produced? Yes. And then the free-range animals are doing what? They're getting a net positive. Yeah, the regeneratively raised, at least at this particular farm, was minus 3.5 pounds per pound of meat produced. So it was a net positive impact versus 33 pounds released with the conventionally raised beef. Now, that was a different analysis. That was data from a different database. But his his analysis showed specifically that regeneratively raised beef was a net positive for the environment. Right. So it's not a threat. It's a support to the environment and to the so-called greenhouse effect. Now, tell us what the findings were with plant-based diets and things like the fake meats. Yeah, that was the exact mirror. So it was 3.5 pounds about released for every pound produced, which is why he said you'd have to eat one of his regeneratively raised beef burgers to offset your emissions of a fake meat burger. Uh, Explain that one for me. I'm a little lost there. Okay, yeah. So because every time you eat a plant-based burger, you emit 3.5 pounds of carbon. Right. You will sequester that carbon when you consume his. So if you're looking to come to neutral and to minimize and just create a zero net impact, you would have to eat the burger that stored carbon in addition to the burger, the meat burger, the Beyond Meat burger that released carbon. Right. And you're referring to eating a regenerative meat burger, not a standard burger. Absolutely. Yes. One of his yeah. from White Oak Pastures. You know, like, isn't it just mind boggling how people are being sold absolute friggin' lies? It's amazing. Yeah. And when you say like these meat burgers, you know, not only are they coming from ge- genetically modified crops a lot of times and conventionally raised um, products. But then they also, they've they've had huge um, problems with their claims around protein and whether or not. And then, um, you know, just that they've kind of backed away from the even the case and the argument that they're better for health, because I think we can just all agree, even Dr. Provenza and Van Vliet, they did an analysis of the metabolites in grass-fed beef and also plant-based burgers. And he found out 90% of those metabolites are very, very different. And so, yeah, it it is a bill of lies, essentially. I think that meat alternatives, you know, if you would prioritize organic agriculture and make them in a more responsible way, they could maybe be part of it, right? But I I don't think that we could ever say that they're going to be better than a regeneratively raised burger. That's just a flat-out lie. 